Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Visual Studio Office Hours. I'm your host for the next hour. My name is Matt Christensen, and um, let me tell you something. I was um, I was writing some documentation the other day uh, for my job. You know, I I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio team, and I was writing a doc for some guidelines for how we internally but also externally handle uh, suggestion tickets. So whenever you suggest a feature for Visual Studio, um, that comes into my team and we look at, at all sorts of things and, and we don't have any guidelines for it. So I decided I should write some. And, uh, you know, that was kind of cool. It, I had to learn how to do it and uh, we have this publishing system and, and I realized that there was just a lot about documentation in general that I didn't know. But I do know that in the past, I have been choosing products based on their level of documentation over their competition. So I'm fully aware of its extreme importance in like there's competitive advantages and all these sort of things. But in sort of a day-to-day -day type of situation, like where I just had to write some documentation, like it just, I just had a lot of questions. And so I'm really happy today that we have uh, with us here, uh, two people from the documentation team at Microsoft from the, from the Visual Studio uh, that handles all the Visual Studio documentation, among other things. And uh, we can talk to them and ask them all these questions about how to write good documentation. Why do we need it? How do we do it at Microsoft? And how does Visual Studio, uh, the Visual Studio team deal with um, documentation in general? So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jill and Justin. And um, Jill, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I am Jill Reinauer, and I'm a part of the Content and Learning organization at Microsoft. Content and Learning is the team that owns docs.microsoft.com and also Learn Content, docs.microsoft.com slash learn, and the Q&A platform. And within that organization, my team writes about Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. And uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been at Microsoft for about 20 years um, and working on content for 15 of those. Wow. All right. Justin? I just learned something about Jill that uh, I didn't know and we work closely together. <laughs> so I'm Justin. I've been at Microsoft um, about a year and a half and I am in the developer division, um, same team as UMADS, and we work on the uh, Visual Studio product and my role is um, kind of a content liaison or advocate. I really work with um, Jill's team with training groups and with our program managers to um, basically help program managers connect with customers through documentation. So that's kind mm -hmm. of my role. All right. So before we sort of get into all the tips and tricks and and how we do things then I have a question for you, Jill. And since you, you know, you've been here so long and you work in the documentation organization, like how how big is it? How many people do we have at Microsoft that writes documentation for their daily job? Yeah. So there are about three large organizations within Microsoft that are completely focused on documentation. One is the content and learning group that I mentioned that's within cloud and AI. And then there's also a large content organization in the business applications group. Um, that's a group that um, the Dynamics products fall under. And then within Office and M365, there's another content group. Um, and there's a few other content folks in various other parts of the company. Um, but those are kind of the big three centralized content organizations. And then, for example, the the Content and, um, content and learning CNAI content group has probably, oh gosh, around 200 content developers and, and content PMs. Um, so it's a pretty big organization. And, and then that group also, that org um, creates and, and maintains the platform docs at microsoft.com mm -hmm. as well. So there's some engineering uh, resources as part of the org also. Okay. So, so that sounds like it's a very large organization just yeah. for handling docs. And I know Justin that you've been working closely with the feature PM. So the, the the program managers on the Visual Studio team that you know 
writes the specifications for the new features uh, that Visual Studio uh, comes out with all the time. And then you work with them and they for them to contribute to the docs as well. So it's not just the 200 people on the docs team, it's it's also the PMs and maybe engineering teams as well. Is that right? Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> so so like from a on a on a sort of a maybe not daily basis, but weekly basis, how how many of our PMs are involved with the documentation? Like how how typical is it that we have like the engineering teams with the program managers and so on um, contribute to the docs? That kind of depends on the team. Um, engineering involvement with docs, I think largely depends on you know how how much it makes sense to have engineering involved with docs. Um, like a, I believe the VS Code teams, there's a lot of engineering involvement with with docs. They write um, kind of what they call quick and dirties, which is a, a quick overview of a new feature or changes to a feature. And then um, they work with content folks to kind of edit that, clean it up, and um, actually publish it. Other teams um, might have more dedicated uh, content resources that are doing most of that. And then other teams, um, it's kind of up, especially smaller teams or um, new products that may not be in GA yet. <clears throat> Those might not have any content resources yet. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that Jill and I work together on a lot is figuring out where those handoffs happen and how to kind of not drop the ball in those handoffs, how we move smoothly from a product that's in preview. Um, and then as that begins to scale out and, and starts having more users, how do we um, onboard you know content people to help out with that um, and just kind of managing those transitions? That's that's something that takes a lot of communication between our, our teams to get right. Yeah. So um, maybe one of the questions I have in all of this is um, like when when should a content author like Jill, one of the, the on your team, uh, when should they write documentation versus when is it the job of a of a of an engineering team to write the documentation? Is there is there a, a sort of a rule of thumb on that? It depends on a lot of things. Um, one of the ways in Visual Studio that we've kind of looked at that is that um, very often for for preview features um, for things that maybe don't have a wide audience yet, a lot of times the, the PM organization starts the documentation on that. They're very close to, they know exactly what's going on with those preview features. And, um, and so they kind of see the documentation. And then once the feature maybe moves to a public preview or to GA or gets wider adoption, um, then at that point, sometimes it'll move into the content organization um, owning the content. So that's kind of one way that we do it, but I mean, it really, it depends. Some of it's based on history and some of it's based on resources and availability and, you yeah. know, all sorts of things. But just for some, some numbers to throw into that, um, the content and learning organization has an OKR this fiscal year, um, a key result around external contributors. So um, it's very much a goal of ours to have more contributors from folks outside of the content and learning organization. So for example, the, the key result this year is to go from 1,207 external contributors to 1,800 roughly. Um, so, so it's something we definitely are putting a lot of focus on and something that Justin and I are partnering on and, and that's the big the big push is to get to get more people contributing to docs from outside the content org. So when you say <clears throat> when you say external contributors, you do you mean uh, like Microsoft employees working in engineering teams, for instance, or do you mean like because the docs are open source, so it could be the you know, community members? So can you clarify? Yeah, yeah, both. Um, yeah, we welcome contributions from Microsoft folks and from from external, and we do get pull requests from the community um all the time and and we love that yeah right all right so um what are some of the like you you alluded to it a little bit jill you said that um, oftentimes it's the engineering teams or the program managers on the engineering teams that start writing 
the documentation or begin in the feature area that they're doing. Um, so is that something you think would be a way to do it for other teams as well, like in other organizations? Like if you have a, if you work at a small company or a medium company or whatever, like would this be the way to go? Like you, you start with engineering and then maybe content writers or maybe you outsource it to content writers um, sort of to do the final editing or, or how could a flow like that uh, sort of work for even for smaller teams? Justin. Yeah, so a lot of my career has been on the engineering side and um, in a lot of places that I worked, documentation, if it happened, um, was heavily dependent on engineers to document what they wrote. <clears throat> um, but I think there's definitely opportunity to scale that as you grow, as your product scales. Um, if you have, you know, not, not everywhere splits the concept of program managers and engineering. Sometimes those those roles are the same thing or they might be split into into different ways. I think there's definitely opportunity to start small, have the people who are building the thing write about the thing. Um, and then as you get bigger, scale that out, maybe have, you know, not every engineer or or program manager is necessarily a great writer. It's there's a reason that's a, a job is it's it's a difficult thing to write and keep things like accessibility and readability and localization, all these kind of scale problems that you have um, as your product scales. At some point, you reach a point where it doesn't make sense for engineering to have to keep all of that knowledge and program management to, to keep all of that knowledge. And so that's where you know the content team is really good at understanding those things and um, giving feedback on the platform to help improve those things and be aware of that. And I think that is kind of how you scale as it probably starts with engineering and program management contributing to um, the docs. And then at some point, you have to level that up a little bit and bring in content professionals to to improve that and scale it out. I think you're muted, Matt. Yeah, sorry. That was a garbage truck that was <laughs> outside. <laughs> I really should move this from Thursdays to like any other day because Thursday is the uh, is garbage day here. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so if you're a small company and you don't have, you know, the budget necessarily for content writers or outsourcing or something like that. At what point is is a uh, is documentation good enough? Like at what point does it add value versus adding like positive value versus negative value? Like I, I would imagine if you if you write like docs really quickly and you don't pay attention to grammar or something like that and you publish that that might have a negative impact on from your customer's perspective or something. Uh, Jill, is there is there like some sort of rule to that? Hmm, I, I don't know that there's, it, it's a good question and something that we wrestle with a lot. What is, what is good content? What, what makes healthy content or what are the measures you look at to say this content is performing well versus this content is not performing well? And there's so many, so many parts to it. Um, some of the things that we look at are, um, feedback that we get from customers. So if we get comments or ratings that indicate something is, is not what the customer wanted, that um, has a very big impact on, on you know, how we prioritize. Um, but we also look at kind of the behavior that users exhibit when they're, when they're looking at documentation. So the things that they click on a page or how long they spend on the page. Do they, do they dwell on the page as long as it should take to read the page or are they um, going someplace else quickly? Um, that would be an indication that maybe they're not finding what they want on that page. Um, we look at bounce rates. If they, they go someplace else within five seconds, that's how we are defining it. Um, and we look at the path, you know, where they came from to get to this content and then where they go after. Um, so there's a whole bunch of metrics that, that we, we pay attention to and then there's also some operational metrics that uh, kind of play into that. It's not so much behavioral, but things like when was the last time we updated the topic? Is it is it still up to date or has it been um, ignored for, for too long and now the screenshots are out of date? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of a freshness metric. Um, and then things like um, broken links or um, 
terms that are are better for accessibility. So there's a lot of things kind of on our side that we look at too that that help um, show what content, what healthy content looks like. Yeah. Can so I expand on that a little bit too. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so one thing to back up a little bit. Um, one thing that I think about a lot in my role is ultimately as a as a division that produces software as a software delivering division we're trying to create good experiences for customers that's what most software companies are trying to do right ship software that is a good experience from end to end and so if you think about what that what that actually means like docs are part of it the product the feature itself like the apis the sdks whatever it is that's part of it but it's this kind of whole journey of I heard about the product from somewhere, maybe a forum, maybe some piece of marketing, maybe a friend. Um, I downloaded that, like maybe I downloaded Visual Studio Community Edition. I engaged with all or some part of that product. Maybe I ran into an issue or needed to learn. I went and read the documentation. And so this, this is kind of a whole journey. And so really like what I'm trying to do is make sure that the docs is thought of as part of that journey, that we're not just thinking of you know, what was my experience in the Visual Studio Solution Explorer? And, um, but really thinking about kind of that whole journey as the product surface, right? And the reason I wanted to call that out is because there's a lot of different customers and different types of journeys in that. And so when you talk about, are the docs good enough or how good is good enough? If you've got a product that is in beta sign up and it's, um, you know, pretty rough around the edges, not polished at all, not enterprise ready. It's kind of a, you know, barely more than proof of concept. Your customer in that case is probably a lot more fault tolerant, right? If the docs are not super well written, not great grammar, maybe they're not even localized into multiple languages. Um, the product is rough around the edges. They're going to be a little bit more tolerant of that because they have said by signing up, I'm kind of saying, I want to try this. I know it's going to be somewhat broken. By the time you actually get to an enterprise level where people are building big scale stuff that depends on this, that's a very different customer. And the documentation you have to surface and the journey of that customer could be totally different. And so a big part of the complexity of this is, is figuring that out. Like <laughs> I was thinking when you asked that question, like, if you find the answer to that, let us know <laughs> because <laughs> we think about it and talk about it all the time. Like what type of customer is this? Where are they in their uh, journey? I think Jill maybe had something more to add. Yeah, it, it's a good point. And I, I, um, I think that the kind of the polish on docs, like you mentioned, if there are grammar mistakes and, and that kind of thing, while it may be doesn't hurt the experience like you can you can figure out what the intent was but it does um, there's a level of trust with the company if you if you go to documentation and um, you see broken links or you see grammar mistakes you sort of you can start to lose trust in the value that's placed on that um, and so and so there's kind of this balance of what is good enough versus what builds that trust and and keeps people wanting to come back yeah so, so you brought up an interesting point about freshness, right? Is is the is the documentation still relevant? Uh, when was it last updated? Does is this does the screenshots match the latest version of the product and so on? Um, let's say that you have a a piece of documentation that two years after it was written is still completely accurate, but it's two years old. And so you know when you when you Google something, you know I do that all the time. I look at the dates. Usually there's a date of when it was last updated in the Google search results, either because the URL has the date, you know, the year in it, or something like that, or or just just print it out. And and I would always go with the latest, uh, just because I don't know what has changed, and so I trust new content maybe more, especially like in software, right, where everything moves so fast. Uh, so in the case of that two year old still relevant documentation, would it make sense to go in and say, OK, let's just update the, the like make a minor change just so that we can say it was updated you know, now uh, to to make it fresh for the search engines and, and on the page and stuff like that? Or is that considered cheating or, or how does that work, Jill? Yeah, I think it's if we do 
a freshness pass, what we call it on on a doc on a topic and you know run through the procedures, check out the screenshots and determine, yep, this is all still up to date, even though it was written two years ago, then changing that metadata for the last updated date is perfectly fine. I don't feel like that's cheating at all. It is still up to date. Um, it, you know, as opposed to you update a, a typo and don't look at the whole topic, what it's trying to say, but then say, yep, this is updated because I changed that typo. That would be kind of the wrong approach. So um, yeah, and and you know, we've, we've thought about right now, I'm pretty sure that that last updated metadata is a manual field. Writers choose to update that. Um, you know, it, in a way it would be nice if that were updated automatically, but then you'd have to set some thresholds on like, well, if it's X number of lines that have been changed in this topic, then we can automatically update so that it wouldn't pick up just a typo or a, a minor change. Um, so I don't know, it, that's something we kind of thought about, um, but for now it's it's manually updated. The writer chooses. Yeah. Okay. Uh so I was made aware of this uh, a while ago um, that we we basically don't have the capacity to to like write documentation for every feature all the time, and so we group things into tiers. So we have the most important features fall into tier one, and they get like dedicated content authors, and then we have tier two. They get like somewhat of a of a content author associated with that to help evolve the documentation in that area. And then tier three is the ones where there is hardly any content authors and it's up to the engineering teams themselves to maintain the documentation. I don't know if I got that right, Justin, or, or is that how it works? Um, kind of. <laughs> I don't know if it's so straightforward. I guess I can give you kind of a concrete example. Um, Code Spaces is a product we've been talking about a lot. And Code spaces has largely been in um, private and then public preview. And because it had a very small group that it was exposed to, it kind of fell into that bucket of these are maybe a little bit more fault tolerant users because they've signed up early um, <clears throat> and they want to try this new thing out. And so that content was pretty much the responsibility of PMs with some light additional resources to figure out as we move towards GA and more people start using that, we reach a point where it's like, now this really needs some, some uh, dedicated content resources. The other thing is, is that's not necessarily constant, right? Like you could have, okay, we've got, you know, 30 docs that were um, written by PNs that were kind of, you know, quick and dirty. Um, they're about to be formally released. They're about to be localized. Um, we need to do a pass for uh, translation. We need to do a pass for accessibility. So that might be a project that needs more resources for a period of time. But then after that, maybe we're not doing big doc changes constantly, but there's just a slow trickle of updates and, and a new uh, doc now and then. <clears throat> then maybe those can ramp back down. So I think Jill might have more to add on that. Yeah, one thing to add, I think the decision on when something is owned by a PM or engineering team versus content, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. And one of those factors might be if if there's a PM or a, a PM team or engineering team that really wants to own the documentation, uh, that's great. We welcome that too. Um, you know, it could be somebody that has a background in writing or just really enjoys writing or wants that additional interaction with customers and, and then, you know, they they can they choose to um, to say hey we we want to own this ourselves and and then the content team can give support for some of the the back end things the repo management or things like localization and accessibility and those things that Justin mentioned. Okay. So <clears throat> so with these different tiers or or you know ownership maybe rather. Uh, like who owns the documentation? Then there is the, the the third aspect, which is the like you have the content owner. Sorry, the content author. You have the engineering team, but you also have the open source community that wants to contribute. And you know that's one of the things I thought was the most exciting thing when we uh, started out doing docs.microsoft.com, which was what five years ago or something like that. It seems 
seems like it's not that long ago, but I think it might have been <laughs> when when it all started out. But the open source, right? So so we can scale out and and I really like that aspect. And 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 you were mentioning you get a lot of, of feedback, or sorry, a lot of contributions, both issues and pull requests. And so I guess it doesn't matter if it's open source. It doesn't matter who the owner is on the engineering side. Like any, you know, you can send a pull request to any of these to fix up some documentation if you want to. Why? Why is it that people do that, Jill? Why? Why is it interesting for for externals to contribute to our docs? Yeah, I think we're lucky that we have customers that really care about the product and really love it and have. Um, really want to contribute and um, you know somebody sees something that they can help out with and they jump in and do it and it's it's pretty amazing um, you know I think some of it might be um, I don't know if there's a, a recognition piece of it like having your name on something or um, or if it's a lot of people really feel they want to give back and you know I learned a lot from the documentation when I was starting out and Hey, here's something I can contribute that I think is a motivation for for sending in pull requests. Justin, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, kind of to piggyback on what you were saying, I think there's it's also a, a good way for people to kind of get their feet wet, right? Like if um, <clears throat> if you want to contribute to an open source piece of software, there might be a lot of kind of overhead of setting up your development environment and you know 17 uh, projects in the solution that you have to kind of learn your way around and um, there could be a lot of overhead to just ramping up especially if you're a newer developer without a lot of experience and I think docs are a great place where people can get some experience contributing getting get experience being part of uh, like an open source community um, and just kind of start building you know a network of of people that they work with or getting some name recognition it's it's a really great place to get started when you know it, it's i feel like a lot easier relative to jumping you know into a big engineering project with both feet to jumping into a doc set um so you could go out and find you know typos or <laughs> things like that in in docs or just find you know a little place where maybe the bullet points aren't that clear for a beginner and you can actually add value to that and have an impact on other people and on um, you know Microsoft fairly quickly um, especially if you're you know kind of newer to engineering and don't have the the competence and experience and all of that to just jump into a, a much more complicated project right away yeah that's a really good point because it looks like all you need really is as a markdown, right? You, you, um, it's all just markdown. So if you know markdown, or maybe you don't even have to know markdown, you can just look at what's there and make the edits right in the in the text, and you might be just fine. And Justin, I know that uh, you came prepared, and you actually are able to show us <clears throat> how this whole system works. Like, how do the do what do the docs look like? How do you edit the docs? Uh, and I guess that's a sort of the same whether you're an external or you're an internal contributor is that right yeah that's right and um i can absolutely do a a super quick overview not like a training session at all um, <laughs> i'll try to keep it quick and, and not get too uh into the details but um yeah i can give a, a quick overview i would love to see it so if you just share your screen i'll make sure that everybody can see it I keep getting some warnings that my internet quality is not great, so hopefully this uh, this all works. So you should right. be able to see uh, one of our docs. I have a big monitor, so I have this blown up, so if I need to scale it a little bit more, let me know. Yep, you're live. Cool, so, um, so this is, you know, this is a doc. Uh, I picked this one because I worked on it um, back when I was directly contributing to docs, and so I'm kind of familiar with it and, and a little easier to prepare to talk about it. So. Um, this is you know the doc itself um, but the docs platform provides quite a few other little things that are worth calling out one of them is you know the breadcrumbs you can see where you are there's this we call this the table of contents or the toc it also renders uh, a little collection of um, shortcuts here so everything that's an h2 will be pulled out and a shortcut created here so you can quickly skim a doc contents 
uh, docs contents and and jump to a specific area. So when you say H2, you mean like the headline uh, size two? Yep. Yep. Oh. Sorry. Um, all of the anything that's a heading of some sort will get a quick link. So if you want to send links to other people um, to a specific part of a doc, like you want to see, you know, I want to send somebody a link to Xamarin Essentials. I can grab this and um, copy that URL and send it to somebody for reference. You can give us feedback on whether or not um, a page is helpful, and that can be as simple as binary yes, no, or um, there's an opportunity, I believe, to, to add uh, some comments as well. Um, and then I think kind of the coolest thing, though, is this edit button right here. And this isn't in every doc set, by the way. Each, each doc set can be configured a little bit differently, but um, many or most have this edit button. Oh, actually, one other thing I, I meant to mention, this filter is really useful. If you're working in Xamarin Forms and you're like, I want to you know, see a checkbox, um, you can quickly filter. I want to see a um, progress bar or um, whatever. This helps you. It's filtering on title and it helps you drill into um, kind of see quickly what what is available in a big table of contents. And then the search up here searches all of our doc, all of our doc sets. So you're searching for something really specific you can get good results here but because it's searching a lot of things um, you may get less relevant results than filtering on titles um, but anyway the cool stuff is the edit button and then the feedback buttons at the bottom of the page so if i want to give feedback on this page like maybe i found a bug um, i am not prepared to you know do my own con contribution and fix it i can click this and oh, I'm getting into yeah, this is the, the, the two factor auth that we have at Microsoft. Yeah, um, so it's started an issue here. I can give it a title. I can enter some feedback in here. Um, it puts in some metadata so that this can be tracked back to a specific page. And then that issue will show up for docs writers, program managers, engineers to um, answer, update the, the doc and close that out. So that's one way that, um, you know, a lot of people don't think of issues as contributions, but they absolutely are issues that, that help us find and identify problems or weaknesses in our documentation is absolutely forward progress. Um, but then you can also just click the edit button and you're taken right to this open source. Um, you get kind of a preview here. There's some uh, YAML metadata that helps our docs platform understand this page's organization and things like that. Um, you can view the raw markdown or I can click edit right now and be editing this file. So um, the so ahead. when you cl just click edit right there, then GitHub will automatically uh, create a branch for you that's kind of hidden such that at the bottom there when you're done with your edit, you can submit a pull request without cloning or forking or opening the, the file on your local desktop. It's all in the browser. It's all right here. So any typos, any small edits, you can just do it straight on directly on GitHub. Is that right? That's right. And this is kind of a special case. I have special permissions on this repo, so its behavior for me might be a little bit different than its behavior for um, just a public contributor. But in most cases, what what actually happens is GitHub is creating a fork and a branch for you behind the scenes automatically. You can make your changes in here. You can actually preview your changes um, and make sure you know it reads the way you expected. You can do a commit, and then once you commit those, um, you can turn that right into a PR, and that will go back to the um, the docs repo kind of owners to review and um, approve. So that's the kind of light workflow. Um, the more common workflow for regular contributors and kind of deeper contributors, there are limitations. Like I can't add images with this. I can't add new folders. Or I can't. There's there's things that I can't do just in the browser. So there's also um, there's also a workflow where you, you know, use like GitHub Desktop or Git Bash or whatever your favorite Git client is. You fork and pull um, the repo down and then work on it in VS Code. And this is the workflow for most of the content, content contributors and PMs that are doing regular edits. Um, this provides a lot of helpful tools like spell checking, uh, markdown, linting. Um, we have something called the Docs Authoring Pack. You can actually see everything that's in it here if if this text is large enough to be readable, but there's a markdown. Is this, is this an extension? 
for VS Code? Yep, it's a, uh, yep, it's a VS Code extension. Um, it has some YAML editing, uh, validating stuff, um, some markdown linting, uh, some spell checking, a variety of things that just help write quality content. And my personal favorite feature of it is I can hit Command Shift or Control Shift V depending on Mac or PC, and I get a preview that you can see is really close to the doc itself. So I can be confident when I push this up, like this is roughly what I'm getting. If I've changed an image or I've reorganized headers or something like that, um, I can get a good idea before it goes through the whole build process. Once you commit and PR, once that PR is accepted, there's a lot of cool stuff that happens. First of all, when you create a PR, it, there's a lot of um, automated grammar checking, spell checking, readability checking, um, checking for you know things we're trying to avoid in terms of uh, things like inclusive language or confusing acronyms. And so a lot of that is checked and that that will call out in your PR as comments, um, things that are recommended to fix. And then once that is fully accepted and the PR is merged, it actually goes out and is in most cases kind of again, repos can be configured in different ways, but it's translated into 13 different languages and published there as well. Um, so wow. There's a lot of things that our docs platform is doing that are pretty cool. I think a lot of people don't realize kind of how sophisticated and how many moving parts there are. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to show that off. That's very cool. Thanks, Justin. Um, you know, when I when I look at that, you know, the first thing that just popped in my head, I don't know, you maybe you thought about this already, but I just thought about it, <laughs> is uh, code spaces. Uh, instead of you having to uh, you know, install an extension on your own, you know, install Visual Studio Code. If you don't have it already, then install that docs authoring tools extension and all this sort of stuff. What about code spaces? What if they're on the docs was one that says edit and, you know, we had a, we would create a code space for you with all those things installed. So you just go straight in, you just use the browser, you just, uh, because it basically runs VS Code in the browser, like a code space. Um, is that something, Jill, that you're looking into? I love it. That's really cool. Uh, I don't think we're looking into it yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me make a note of that. Um, well, so I guess there is, uh, I guess there is a potential issue in that, you know, that would, I think by default, then that would, um, be something potentially that whoever contributes will have to pay for. And I think for something like, like this, we probably want to foot the bill so we get those contributions in and, and, and anyone who contributes are not, you know, forced to pay. That would be horrible. Yeah, and I think we'd have to look too at what, um, how much use that would get, you know, what are, are en enough external contributors wanting to do the bigger, more in-depth contributions um, that would benefit from having VS Code and having the extension available versus something that you can do on on the web in GitHub, just a quick edit here or there. Yeah, or the internal PM organization, right? Because Justin, I know that um, that you've been working on like getting them to contribute more and take more ownership of, of the docs and, and all this sort of stuff and, and that there's been some challenges with that. Um, and I'm guessing that one of the challenges is that there's some moving parts. There's some things to understand about Git and um, and the workflow and what extensions to install and how to actually do this. That if if that was if we if the barrier was as low as possible, then that would be easier to get internal contributions. Is that right? That's absolutely something that uh, Jill's team and I talk about a lot, and the teams around Jill and. Um, the docs platform team, I think we're all really interested in finding ways to reduce complexity, um, finding ways to train and scale out that training because yeah, the, the overhead of training and not just training, but keeping those skills from atrophying, right? Like if I taught you how to edit docs today and then you didn't do it for two months, I basically have to retrain you because you're going to forget all, you know, all of the, at least the details. You might be able to muddle through it, but you need regular use of those skills to kind of keep those from atrophying. So all of those things are are barriers that we're trying to look at and reduce. Um, yeah, I, as you were talking about the code spaces, I was thinking like, yeah, we haven't actually talked about dog fooding that, and uh, that might be a good idea. 
Yeah, I think that it might be really helpful. I think another part of the complexity, sometimes when we are addressing GitHub issues, for example, a question might be about a particular version or dot version or a preview release. And so the person who's responding to that issue, in addition to getting their doc environment set up, may have to install a different version of Visual Studio or, you know, go through, you know, various pieces that to kind of mimic the the scenario that the customer had when they um, submitted this issue. And so, you know, resolving any single GitHub issue can take a long time because you have to get all that set up. So yeah, potentially having code spaces that that get the authoring part of it for you could be really helpful. Cool. Yeah, that might be something that would be interesting for, uh, you know, any viewers here that is considering doing more documentation or, or open sourcing or something like, how can you lower the barrier to have more people contribute. Um, I'm sure there's a there's a bunch of ways. So, um, all right, Jill. So you talked about in the very beginning, like just how many people we actually have, and in, just in your group, there's 200 on the content theme uh, team, and you said there were two other groups around Microsoft of similar size or something like that. Um, now that's a lot of people, and so how many how many docs do they actually then Right. If we just start with Visual Studio, just to keep it in the, you know, to the to the audience here, they're all Visual Studio users, I'm sure. Like how many docs is that pages? Do we measure that in number of pages do we have for Visual Studio? I don't know who yeah. to ask this question. Is that you, Jill? Yeah, I have some numbers on that. Gosh, do I have them? I don't think I have it off the top of my head. Um, Visual Studio docs. Well, and there's lots of ways to slice and dice it, but roughly 3,000 articles are just Visual Studio, just the latest version. There's another set of docs for Visual Studio 2015 that's probably about the same size. Um, 2017 and 2019 kind of share a doc set, except for a handful of topics that are different about one or the other. Um, and that's just conceptual docs. There's also reference docs. There's Visual Studio SDK. Um, there's then some of the other repos that um, like uh, code spaces is in is in a its own repo and live share docs are in its own their own repo um, and then the localized versions of all of those yeah it, yeah Justin uh, what are your thoughts so um, one fun number I think in the Microsoft Docs GitHub org. There are over 5,000 repositories. Um, so that just gives you a scale of just the number of repositories. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, like Jill was saying, I mean, there's things that you might not even think of as a product that needs documentation. But so Visual Studio is a product, right? But then you might be paying for an enterprise subscription of Visual Studio. And that itself is a product. Um, and we have a doc set for Visual Studio subscriptions. We have a doc set that is just for roadmap and release notes type of stuff. That's separate from the doc set of how to use Visual Studio because it's it's covers conceptually different things. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of, I mean, like I've said a couple of times, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of um, people involved, a lot of, you know, just effort going into trying to consistently um, deliver and improve our documentation as part of the whole kind of product experience. Jill, I think you had something more maybe. Yeah, just in terms of, you know, the scale, that's a huge number of docs. And so then on the flip side, one of the things we look at is are there are there docs that we need to retire? Um, and so sometimes we will work on a we'll call it weed the garden project and um, look at things that have had zero page views in the last three months for example, and can any of those be deleted and redirected? And you know, in some cases they can't, it's it's part of a whole or, you know, we're documenting the UI. And so if you took out one piece, that wouldn't make sense. But there are cases where, you know, either the technology has changed or um, for whatever reason, this doc is not useful to customers. And so um, instead of letting it continue to be a weed in our garden, um, can we can we get rid of that? Yeah. So uh, I think I've seen sometimes that some portions of the old documentation is 
is it archived? Is that what we call it? We it's basically not showing up on docs.microsoft.com, but you can still download them or or how does that work? Yeah. Correct. There's an archive or a previous versions area within docs and um, some of that content is not indexed for search engines and so you wouldn't find it. But if you go to the archive, then you can search through that TOC and get to you know, a previous version of Visual Studio if you need that. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to make sure that we always have the latest and greatest up and available through search engines and so on. And I guess that's super important, right? You get a lot of traffic to the docs from search engines, I take it, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, I think roughly 50% of the traffic comes from search engines. And so that's another metric that we look at, uh, just how much is coming from organic search, how much traffic comes from um, referrals from other Microsoft.com pages or from within docs specifically. Um, and then direct traffic is the other bucket that we look at. Yeah. Is there like a correlation between the things that people uh, find in docs, uh, like they want to learn more about? And then, you know, the and then the individual features in Visual Studio. So let's say, as an example, um, the new find in files dialog that we have in Visual Studio 2019. Um, if people go in and search for it and find it and read the docs on it, um, or they may, may even open bugs on, on the documentation, do we then kind of understand that it could be that we have some issues with the, not the docs itself, but with the feature? Like maybe people don't understand the feature and therefore they they go to the docs website for more explanation or or how do we how do we manage that relationship between the feature and the and Can the I docs? Take this one? Go for it, Justin. Uh, this is uh this is actually like kind of the driving thing of my role is I have this belief that um you know traditionally the majority of issue review and issue closure has happened by content people. Um, I, I have a hypothesis that I'm working on testing and, and um, pushing uh, you know, improvement to. I believe that the way that our customers interact with docs has a lot of potential to tell us more about product problems or how to improve that kind of high level journey that I talked about. I feel like docs are, are a critical part of that. And that is actually my job is to try to improve how our program managers engage with docs, engage with the content people, engage with customers. Um, to use an example, you know, if you have docs on, um, just use Xamarin Forms again, because it's the docs that I'm, I'm actually still the most familiar with. If you have uh, huge search engine traffic for one specific control in that doc set, well, what does that mean? It could mean that it's really, really popular. Everybody's using it. Um, it's a, one of the first things that people want to learn about. It could mean that the API is not very good and engineering or, or program managers need to take a look at that. Um, how customers, you know, are filing issues, you know, so that's that's looking at traffic. Um, how customers file issues. Um, a lot of times docs issues might be reflective of an actual issue with the product itself, not just, you know, there's a typo on this page or I don't understand, you know, the um, steps one, two and three. It might be that we find bugs or flaws in the product itself or just um, opportunities to really improve that experience. And that's that's really what I'm trying to focus on and, and improve is that that integration and the workflow between all these people that we've talked about. We have a lot of program managers. We have a lot of content writers. We have a lot of tech involved in this. How do we unite all these things? How do we reduce the friction of that? communication, the, the friction of those workflows, how do we bring that down and bring ourselves closer to our customers and, and understand them better? That's kind of the whole the whole goal that Jill and I and a lot of people work together on. Yeah, and so I take it there's uh, the relationship between the docs and the engineering teams producing the features that the docs are about is sort of an iterative process. It's not just like, you know, the best thing would be if you start writing the docs as you define the feature. I, I I think that would probably help you define the feature to begin with to write the spec if you were to write it in a way that you were like showing people how to use it before it even exists. And keep that iteration going as you develop and as you get real screenshots instead of mockups and so on, keep keep improving it. And then after you're shipping your feature, 
keep modifying and running the analytics to figure on the docs to figure out like do we have to make product changes to that you know that was made visible through the use of docs and so on is that sort of, I, I take it that's it's sort of a holy grail that that doesn't exist fully <laughs> um but is that kind of like where we want to go we talked a little bit about this uh, before that's why i'm asking this very specific question <laughs> um how, what's your take on that justin yeah um that's complicated, right? It's really complicated to figure that out and scale it. Like, how do we, you know, how do we do this well without having people just sitting in meetings and reading email instead of doing useful work? Uh, I mean, that can be useful work, right? But if you're an engineer, the time you spend sitting in meetings and communicating and stuff is kind of overhead where you're not doing actual engineering. I mean, that, that's a hard problem. and. Right now, in my opinion, what what we have is um, teams have largely evolved their own workflows. Um, and some of those have less friction than others. Some of them are a little better. We're trying to find opportunities to improve that across the board without taking away. Like usually those evolve for reasons, right? Like every team is not the same. Every product is not the same. And so we have to strike this balance of creating standardization and efficiencies that we can scale across teams without causing major disruption where we we come in, you know, it's, it'd be super arrogant to come in and say, okay, now you have to all do things this way because this is the way. And, um, you know, that's like, that's kind of my customer. My, my customer is program managers, content people, and indirectly, the Microsoft customer because I'm trying to improve these processes for the Microsoft customer without destroying the day to day workflow of program managers. And so, yeah, it's a tricky problem. Um, we have a lot of different evolved solutions. Some of that can be standardized. Some of it can't. It, they, those solutions evolve that way for a reason. Like I was saying, sometimes engineers are heavily involved in docs. Sometimes they're not involved at all. Um, sometimes program managers write most of the docs. And like Jill was saying, some of them love that, some of them hate it, some of them are great at it, some of them are like, I'm not a writer, I'm terrible at it. How do we accommodate like individuals and the unique context of different kinds of product development, but still improve efficiency and deliver a standard experience, or like a, a quality experience across the board? That's that's what we're working towards. That's how, like, there's no easy answer for that, right? It's a uh, it's a line somewhere on a gradient. Right. It kind of um, begs the question a little bit to have um, is if there are any areas that does not need documentation and therefore free up resources to concentrate on the areas that do. As an example, let's say we do a new feature, the new, I'm just going to use it again, the find and files uh, feature. So. You probably know this in Visual Studio. You can you can search through your, some some folder and you can find all the files in that folder that has some text in it that matches your search term. It's it's sort of very simple in the way it works. Uh, I'm sure it's not simple in, simply in its implementation, but the concept is very simple, right? Uh, does that need documentation? Like, is that not self-explanatory? At what point does the feature have to have documentation, Jill? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. Um, one consideration is something like F1 help. So if there's a UI element and and um, there's a possibility of clicking F1 to get more info, then we have to have a target for that. Um, and so that may be a, a reason to have a page that, that users can land on. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely cases where the, the UI, the design is such that you shouldn't need documentation and that's fine. It kind of gets to the, the point of like these huge content sets. Where, where can we reduce? Where can we, where do we not need content? That's great. <laughs> right. It's like any software project, right? What, what, uh, what code can I delete? Uh, you know, and sometimes less is more, right? It's maybe it's easier to find. It's easier to reason about. Um, and, and that could be the same for docs, I take it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we only got a, a, a few minutes left here. Is there anything that you would uh, encourage our listeners or viewers to do when it comes to documentation? Like what is what is the, the tips to give them 
um, for their own docs. Justin? So probably be uh, better for Jill. She's more in the uh, in the day to day writing. I think my my big tips would be um, we spend a lot of time talking about accessibility. We spend a lot of time talking about um, ways to reduce friction and make it easier to get from I have a doc idea to I have a doc published. Um, those are those are big things I can think of. Um, so make it yeah. as easy as possible. Like make it easy, and you know, remember individuals. Like it's easy when you're looking at, especially at scale, big numbers and stuff, to kind of lose sight of individuals, and and you can really go wrong that way, right? Like you could write your docs for um, beginners and lose the experts with you know too much uh, kind of handholding. You could do the opposite and fill your docs with acronyms and um, assumptions of existing knowledge that doesn't exist. So it's, mm. yeah, it's hard to come up with a like one line of like this one, this one tip. <laughs> Jill, I don't know, do you have more to add? Yeah, um, one thing I'll share is the, um, we have at Microsoft uh, three voice principles for for any kind of documentation content that we write and and so we want all of our content we want the voice to be warm and relaxed crisp and clear and ready to lend a hand so those are kind of just principles for for any good content um, to have that sort of voice um so that's the in the thing, writing that's in the writing style yeah yeah so um you know warm and relaxed um try to be human <laughs> we're people talking to other people um, it doesn't have to sound robotic. Um, and the crisp and clear, you know, that gets to some of so things like sentence structure and um, scannability of a topic, um, making sure that um, just that that it's it's easy to read. Um, and then ready to lend a hand. You know, we we want we want to sound like we are, you know, we're here to help and so we want the documentation to come across that way too that 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 whatever we can do to, to lend a hand to make your experience better that's that's what we want to do um and then i would say what what helps us the most is if users leave feedback and rate topics um leave suggestions submit pull requests all of that is super helpful to us and and we we really we look at all of those as signals. So, yeah. All right. Sounds like I need to uh, to do more of that. Um, and I hope that our viewers is going to do the same. So, um, you know, when you visit docs.microsoft.com, don't be shy. Hit the like or unlike button if you were helped or not. Open issues and pull requests. Um, and it makes it better for everyone. It's a it's a really a great way to contribute, right? Um, it's kind of easy. You can do it just in the browser if it's just a simple, simple little fix. That seems like something worth yeah. doing where you can help a lot of other people. It's not about helping Microsoft, I think. To me, it doesn't sound like it's about Microsoft. It's about helping other people that are in the same situation as you that need information to unblock them to continue their development work. And so this is a great opportunity to do that and you know, make make the world a little bit better, I guess, for some people. So. Um, and it's, awesome. I just added a, an OKR for you to do 10 con con contributions per month for uh, the rest <laughs> of the year. So, <laughs> okay, okay, I, I gotta, I have to sign up for that, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. We are out of time, and um, this was wonderful having you on. So, thank you so much, and thanks for all the great work you're doing on the documentation. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks, Vance. And to all the <clears throat> to all the viewers, we're going to move the show from Thursday to Monday, starting already next Monday, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, so two hours later. And um, that's going to be super interesting. And uh, there are some good reasons why, and I'm going to talk about that um, Monday. And um, so with that, uh, thank you so much, and see you then.